Hello and welcome to Escaping Kerberos, the podcast where we rewatch, reminisce, and review everything Doctor Who from 2005 to present. My name is Rich, and I'm joined by my partner in crime, Amy. Hi. And today we are discussing episode six of series one, which I'm not even going to hold back. It's the best episode of the damn series. It it's is the good. final, eventual return of the Daleks, or Dalek in this episode. Mm -hmm. Dalek. Which Dalek. aired on the 30th of April 2005, so not long before our birthday. Imagine Yay. if it had aired, like, really close to our birthday. I mean, that is about as close as you can get. It's like three days out. True. Long game aired on the 7th <laughs> of May, but we'll talk about that one next week. Uh, but yeah, so welcome to the episode that I think both of us have been looking forward to the most since we started yeah. this podcast. We've been saying a week. Oh, we get to watch oh, Dalek God. this week. Even just seeing the next time at the end of World War Three was just like, oh my God, next week oh. we get to talk about oh. Dalek. And we oh, ended God. ended the podcast last week just like, oh my God, we get to talk about Dalek. And now we're finally here getting to talk <laughs> To talk about, about Dalek. Dalek, which, uh, as said, is one of my favourite episodes of all time. It might be my personal favorite episode of new who oh really like overall i think mm. that's quite interesting i can't think of anything that like really screams out to me but then again my favorite episode of classic who is remembrance of the daleks mm, so true so, i just i just like daleks okay just love a good dalek i love a good dalek i can see three of them on your bookshelf yes i have three of them on the bookshelf <laughs> if you watch any of the uh, the who culture videos where i've actually on camera then you can uh, see them behind me in fact in a video I put up recently, I actually zoomed in on them because I talked about how I was obsessed with Daleks. <laughs> and it's like, look, there are Daleks very out of focus on my uh, on my shelf behind me. In fact, that's only three of them that you can see. I have another three on mm. my shelf that are smaller. I have a uh, a pop vinyl version of the, um, the the Scout Dalek, the Reconnaissance Dalek from Resolution as well. Do you? Yeah. Oh. Have you not seen it? It's, Maybe. it's literally on my shelf. I mean, you can't see it. Uh on the webcam now it's literally I'm just past sure. my doom uh steelbook it's just out out I of just view. might i might just not have realized it was a pop final um and then i have like a little dalek on my work desk that you can like you flick a switch underneath it and it's like slightly vibrates and it moves along the table and i just set it <laughs> off towards heppel's direction every so often um but anyway so the doctor and rose land in Utah 2012 and they land underground in a big museum, a great big alien museum where they find loads of random bits and bobs, the Roswell spaceship myelometer, British Levine's arm. Uh, and then the first kind of the, f actually it's not really the first callback to the classic series because the Autons in episode one are a callback to the yeah. classic series. But we get our first uh, look at the kind Cybermen like in New York. Super Who. recognizable. Yeah, because I mean the Autons, which they appeared in a bunch of serials back in the 1970s, uh, they weren't really like mm. hugely popular. Re like, yeah, it made sense Memorable. to bring back a relatively known alien for the episode one. But um, here we see a Cyberman, which I, I don't know what era of Cybermen it's from. I want to say it's from like the second Doctor era. Like, mm. um, oh, what's it called? The there's a the episode where you see the Cybermen walking down the um the steps outside of. Is it St. Paul's Cathedral in London? They recreated that shot in... Um, I have no idea. They recreated the shot in, like, Dark Water or Death in Heaven. Um, no idea, I think right. it's that era of Cyberman. But then again, the Cybermen's design didn't change for quite a long time in the classic mm. series. But anyway, yeah, there's a Cyberman helmet in a, in a window. And it's... The first thing I love about that particular sequence with the Doctor looking at him and, and saying, you know, this is my old friend, or actually it's an enemy, is the way that they frame it so you see the reflection of the helmet almost perfectly sitting on the Doctor's head. Over and you get face. like an, You get like a... Uh, sort of like a, an indication as to how big that helmet must be. Yeah. Like, it looks massive on him. But, um, but yeah, so... You know, he touches the glass, the alarm goes off, and they all get caught. So, welcome to Dalek, which... Uh, mm. Were, which I don't really know even where to begin with Dalek. No, I mean, it's just it's... I, I could just go through the episode and talk about stuff, but to be honest, there's not like there's there's moments we can talk about like particular scenes, and there are there is mm. one particular scene we will absolutely get to. Um, but it's just uh, there's so much to to dig into about Dalek. See, the first thing I want to know is the fact that Rose goes 2012. That's so close, and I'm literally like, no, but, it's mate, it's that was eight, eight years, years ago. ago. <laughs> Like, like this was in the. I mean, bear in mind, Dalek aired over fifteen years ago. 
Oops. Like, I think it was literally the other day that it was 15 years since um, Eccleston regenerated into David Tennant in the past. Yeah, wasn't it yesterday or something? Uh, I don't think it was yesterday. I remember was... you turning to me and saying it, and I was it like, was, oh. It was recently. <laughs> it was recently. But um, I think the best place where to start is, um, this episode was written by Robert Shearman, who, I'm going to have a look quickly and see if he's written anything else for Doctor Who, um, like as in New Who. Mm. Uh, I'm not entirely sure he has. I don't think he has, but Dalek originally actually started out as a Big Finish audio drama. All right. I, you know, I don't, I don't keep up with the Big Finish stuff massively. In fact, I've only no, listened to I. maybe one Big Finish story. I, I think, think I got I've it. Listened to any I want to say I got it free in a Doctor Who magazine like forever ago. <laughs> I might try and dig it out. It was a seventh Doctor story. I don't even know whether I had the seventh Doctor in it, but I know that Sof- Sophie Aldred as Ace was in it. Yeah. Because there's a line in it which says "scratch on a diamond." And for some reason, I can remember that line so vividly. So if you're listening and you know Big Finish, tell me what Big Finish story Ace says. Look at that, a scratch on a diamond. Weird. And I'll give you a cookie. Okay. Um, <laughs> But big f- this episode, Dalek, started out as an episode written by Robert Shearman, who wrote Dalek, uh, called Jubilee, which was uh, released in 2003, and it starred the Sixth Doctor, because that was kind of where Big Finish came into its own, was with Doctor Who and the Sixth Doctor, because they gave the Sixth Doctor a whole era that he just didn't get mm. when, he w- when Colin Baker was the Doctor. And one of these stories was called Jubilee. And I'm just going to read you, the, like, very quickly give you the... Um, the, the, the summary of what synopsis. happens. The synopsis. Um, so the Doctor and Evelyn, whoever that is, uh, mm-hmm. obviously it's a companion. Dr. Evelyn Smith is a companion, obviously creative for Big Finish. Great. Um, they land in London in 2003. This did release mm-hmm. in 2003, so present day for the time. Uh, but, it, but it turns out that London's like dirty and dusty and horrible, and it turns out that this is an alternate timeline. England is now the English Empire, has become the central political power of the world, following the events of the Great Dalek War of 1903. Oh, and Joyce. it's ruled by President Rochester, who holds the sole surviving Dalek in the universe as a captive and uses it as part of his propaganda campaign of death. So... Oof. As much as the setting for this is very different from what we Heavy. have in Dalek, the rough sort of idea of a lone captive Dalek is still present, and that's obviously been brought over. I think the the scope concept that... like, I don't know whether Robert Shimon looked at Jubilee and thought, could we just recreate this with the Ninth Doctor and Rose instead? But mm. I think thinking of like an alternate London... And that kind yeah. of time, and alternate timelines for... I mean, we do six- eventually get an alternate London, though, don't we? We do. The, that's uh... the series too. Mm. but this is six episodes into the reboot series so yeah. people like obviously i know that we're quite seasoned in doctor who um people re- starting with series one six series in getting a different bloody timeline and stuff it would throw everything six out episodes, of whack. Not series, but six sorry episodes. six episodes in oh, um <laughs> like that maybe wouldn't have worked but the idea yeah. that you've got this like egotistical asshole having a dalek in his own little cell. oh my god he's so it's just so poignantly american yeah, <laughs> but that's Which, what went on to inspire Dalek. But yeah, let, let's talk about let's talk about um, Mr. Henry Van Mr. Stan, Van Staten, uh, played by, if I remember rightly, Corey Johnson, who right. is is he American? He is American, mm. uh, because obviously so many people in Doctor Who who play American characters, especially in that, are all actually British. Yeah, uh, but no, Cor- Corey Johnson is indeed the American actor playing Henry Van Staten, the man who owns the internet. He's I mean, he did a fantastic job of making me think what an absolute arsewipe. Yeah. Um, he's, uh, I mean, the introduction you get to him is just literally what, like, first of all, the helicopter lands and says Bad Wolf 1, Bad Wolf cool. 1 landing We've or got whatever. Box. We did the Bad Wolf so, reference this time. Good oh. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it's literally like he's walking down the corridor and all of a sudden he's just like, thanks for your opinion. You're out. Get out. You're an ass. And it's like, Eh, eh, eh. Who are Wipe you? his memory, Who are you? leave him on the road someplace. Like telling his telling his employees to laugh at his jokes. It's like, okay, this I'd guy intrude a window. <laughs> like, he's a he's a billionaire. <laughs> he's he's an asshole, and you can tell. Mm. But th- it's weird. Like you you hate him, but you you still want to see where things go for him. I, th- he's not the kind of character that I wanted to, to die. I no. want to see where he went with his mm. approach to his business to his employees um but he's well written enough to be 
it's kind of it's kind of weird. He's he's a very unique character in the way that, like I said, I hate him because he's an asshole. Yeah. But I don't want him. I don't want to see him die. He's not enough of an asshole to think, yeah, you deserve to be dead. He, but I think that's the sort of he's very hum humanly asshole. Like you know these people in real life. You know these people. Like everybody has come across somebody like this who thinks that what they're doing or what they want to do is worth more than what anybody else thinks, and that their opinion is godly. And the world that they're revolves not gonna around listen. them. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I think that's why it's like you hate him on like a personal level, but not like you wouldn't want to see these people dead. You just don't ever want to have to deal with them. Um, yeah. And so it's kind of like that. But I mean, we get a very good sort of like alteration of his character, which yeah. is like how he changes throughout the episode and that sort of thing. Um, but even down to like when there's a there's a point I've always found really funny in, in Dalek after the Doctor has been introduced to the Dalek and tries to kill it and uh, he's escorted away and Van Staten comes in and you have the shot from within the Dalek's eye stalk and they frame it in <laughs> such a way that they make him look really dumb because it's the, the really central funny. circle of the Dalek's eye stalk sort of, it's slightly like fish-eyed, only slightly and slightly mm -hmm. zoomed in and um, they frame it so you've got um, his eyes like above this ring and then his mouth below it so it looks like he's like a his his whole head's like a pear like one of those magic mirror things where it yeah. like cuts your face in half like they they frame like they frame him so um like they Comically. introduce him as such this like, this really like egotistical asshole he can just get rid of people like that if he doesn't mm -hmm. like what their opinion is like you know i don't think it's wise to replace the president well i'm going to wipe you wipe your brain and go yeah, away get out um and then they frame him as like we're going to hide behind this door lock lock the doctor in because he's you can tell he's kind of scared and then as soon as he sees the opportunity to step in and and take credit or like somebody's like somebody's taken his work a step forward he's going to put his foot in and go right this is mine mm -hmm. now he does that and then the show quite literally visually frames him as looking an idiot <laughs> like a bit of a knob. it's brilliant like you like the, even the doctor like i mean the doctor would talk to him like how he like like he does like he wasn't mm -hmm. gonna be like civil he the fact that he's you know taking alien artifacts and just digging leaving them underground like he's like well you're boring like you suck yeah. I'm i don't, I don't you. like you so they they he he we we know that there's that relationship and then they really push it onto the viewer to say you shouldn't like this guy like mm. just his dialogue his approach to um the british even though interestingly as you said he points out that rose is british but doesn't point yeah. out the doctor has a british accent because i mean the doctor obviously sounds like he's from the north we've had this conversation um but like yeah so the doctor starts talking and henry van staten doesn't say anything and then all of a sudden rose says something and he goes oh she's british or whatever and it's like yeah, did you not think that the alien stood in front of you also sounded British? My mind um, instantly went to like maybe Van Staten's just a bit of a sexist asshole. Like he'll yeah. he will almost listen to a bloke, but then he'll just see a girl and go ah no. But then you realise that his second in command after Matey gets fired is Diana Goddard, who yeah. is a woman, and he's very civil with her. So I don't know. Maybe maybe it's just that he the Doctor presents himself and he enters the room and he's like yeah you're an idiot you're holding that wrong it just looks stupid. He's commanding uh, that sort whereas of Whereas with Rose instantly. he has got no idea who she is no idea what she's like so the first thing he grabs is the fact that she's English. So mm -hmm. the first thing that grabs that he grabs from the Doctor is the fact that he knows something about this that obviously my British genius boy doesn't. Yeah. Whereas Rose is just like, oh, it's just a hot British bird. Here you go, little mm -hmm. Rafonroy, got you a girlfriend, go canoodle or spoon or whatever. I mean, he does do. look at Goddard in like a very similar kind of, I feel like in a very kind of sexist way, because she says, obviously, like, they're just, what is it she says about the Democrats because they're just so funny or something. Yeah. And um, he's like, I like you, Goddard. But then he looks at her as almost like, yeah, I like you because you're a tall, hot bitch. Like... <laughs> stern woman who can definitely hold herself i don't mm. know he's a he's an interesting character but yeah I, I really like how they they portray this guy just hiding in his big castle and you know puppeteering his minions down below and happily like passing people off like they, they're he's, everyone's replaceable yeah. nothing like that dalek is unique everyone else don't care everyone oh, yeah, i mean he literally says at one point everyone else is indisposable like yeah i don't need them i need that dalek and that's the point when before it's like that's what's really really frustrating about his character is like you literally cannot see that people are dying and all you care about is your little collection yeah 
and that's why it's uh, again poignant but uh <laughs> speaking of arsehole men let's talk about adam mitchell i nearly called him ricky then <laughs> ricky <laughs> I don't know. for goodness sake played by bruno i mean i can't i can't complain at you for thinking he's ricky i kept calling harriet jones martha for the last two mm. weeks i've got no yeah, idea why you did Please, somebody stop me. Played by Bruno Langley. Uh, so we're introduced to him as, you know, the British kid who's uh, dealing with artifacts, paid $800,000 for a musical instrument that uh, obviously, since he's happily pissing away cash, he can just throw it on the floor. 800 grand, screw it. Just chuck that down, don't Bye. care. Um, and so this guy's a genius. He takes a real liking to Rose. Maybe he's the more, like... I don't want to say sexist compared to I, I Henry just Van Staten. He's just a bit more like, oh, a girl. Hello. I, just, I look at him. Oh, I look at him and I'm literally like, you're such a dick. I do not <laughs> like you. Like, yeah. and I don't know whether it's because I know what's coming up in the next episode, but I don't think he's a likable character even in this. Like, no, he's not. The whole the whole scene between him and Rose. Ugh as like in when, the when they're in his office when they're in his office and she's like twiddling her hair and getting closer to him and she's got that like look in her eye no just no how about you don't <laughs> and she, it, it's more it's more him when he says uh oh yeah i can't i'm a genius yeah and like mm. god i can imagine you at school yeah like you, you were remind, the kid that had no friends you remind me of the people that genuinely came into facebook to slag me off for doing a media degree who went off yeah. and did maths it's like, are you really going to go out of your way to slag me off because I'm you're so because I'm much cleverer than you? Do I you doing a oh. media degree? Oh. Like he's definitely that kind of person. I can see, I can see him. I can see him from my days at school. I can um, feel him. Uh, but it's that it's that line when he says, "Oh, fantastic!" and she says, "Oh, you sound like the doctor." And he goes, "Are you too?" And she goes, "Oh no." And he goes, "Good." And he goes, and "Just, it, why is just it is sl- sneaky side oh. eye." And oh. I'm there going, "Bruno, not Bruno. That's his that's his acting name, Adam." <laughs> You've just bloody met her, man. Literally, she could like, be a psycho. Like you can see, the, the, the in terms of like casting, admittedly, there's only like what two women you see in the staff. You've got Goddard, and you've yeah. got that, and you've got um, DiMaggio. Yeah. Uh, it's like there, there are obviously there are women here, D- dude. You don't have to just suddenly hit on the British girl who's been here for five seconds. I mean, but maybe mm, he does. She... Maybe he works his way around the. Uh, the, the the female staff members maybe. I mean, Rose bit... is looking very uh very tight, tight in this episode. Toit. She's got. <laughs> it's Toit. what I'm, I was I was quoting um uh thingy from Brooklyn Nine Nine. Jake you know, Peralta. Toit. Yeah, him. Um, toit. Anyway, toit. toit. Not the point. <laughs> wow. Rose is looking very very tasty, shall we say, in this episode. She's okay. got that skimpy top on. She's got like hair all nicely curled and like bits out to the side that she can twirl around her finger and it's like do you think mm, do you think they style mm, they definitely styled that on purpose to make her like the hot one of the I episode mean, yeah i think i mean in in doctor who history there have been many attractive uh, mm-hmm. female companions it's not exactly anything new but they'd always pair up with the dalek there's um pictures of i think it was katie manning back in the 1970s who played uh joe Yes, Maybe. and there's pictures of her like stark bollock naked up against a Dalek. Jesus, Same what? with um, uh, oh goodness me, what's her name? She played Perry. I have I to look at this know. now. Perry Brown, uh, an American companion played by a Brit, uh, oh. Nicola Bryant. She oh, did. Right. She used to wear lots of cleavagey things. Uh, with of the sixth course. doctor and there's a oh, there's a, an episode with her in a bikini and it's played up on quite a lot and i'm pretty certain she did stuff with daleks as well so they're probably I mean, trying to sort of more maturely mirror that approach of look we've got a hot girl um mm-hmm. as you pointed out nips for days yeah uh, yeah i mean rose's nips top. are not like not to be like put like do you know what i mean like people have nipples get at the end it. of the day that was how things very much were back in the noughties yeah i mean she's clearly wearing a thin bra because you can yeah. see the bra line under her top and it's not padded and like it's i literally sat there and i went nips but it's like it's not a problem because i mean girls have nipples like yeah. do you know what i mean like it's I said, not that like was seeing... how that was how a lot of like the the sort of sexy women were dressed in that mm. era like you look at but something I... like um I, my mind always goes to things like I just think of like Jennifer Aniston and anything 
Up, uh, yeah. In the noughties. And then, like, mm-hmm. Kirsten Dunst in Spider-Man 1, when they make out in the... um. Uh, in the alleyway when they make up upside make out yeah. upside down and he swings away and it's like oh she's okay um mm-hmm. like that's they, i think that was kind of a, a mirroring of that but they didn't go all out of let's do a photo shoot with billy piper topless mm, against the dark i thank mean i God. think maybe that's because like bringing it back they tried to appeal they've it matured, to they've matured more, it they've matured yeah. it big time but, but also um, family friendly yeah <laughs> we don't want I mean, to make family posing. friendly back in the day as well and yet mm. the sixth doctor strangled said cleavage perry so oh, that was that was fun but uh, anyway. but yeah um <laughs> back to adam he's a he's just a bit of an asshole really isn't he yeah i just, just i think he carries himself like like you said like one of these assholey people that's like oh, i'm so clever i don't need anybody to tell me blah, 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 blah. It, it's that, like, that point when he goes out. down to the vault with rose and he uh one of the scientists goes, oh, you can't be down here. And he goes, oh, well, level three access, special clearance, Mr. Henry Van Staten. It's like, I bet you this was the guy who was a prefect who walked around oh, pretending yeah. like he was the head teacher. Where's your hall pass, mister? Who can't come through here because I'm a prefect. There's a video that I can just picture right now of, of a prefect doing that. That's exactly how Adam was at school. I can just picture Percy from Harry Potter. Mind your <laughs> attitude, Malfoy. Malfoy. Mind your attitude, Mitchell. Ooh. Actually, no, he'd be the one saying it, so that doesn't really work. But, uh, yeah, that's kind of how he is. And even, like, through the episode, seeing him running away from the Dalek, and he goes, great big alien death machine, defeated by a flight of stairs. Yeah, he's, like, the way he, he's so cocky. He's an ass. Yeah, the way he presents that line, it's just like, wow, dude, okay, look at and you. And I'm big, literally like... Oh, look, here he is, Billy Big Balls. And then as soon as the Dalek elevates, look on his face. He's like, oh, I crap, I shouldn't have I'm, said that. It's like I was stood there and I, well, I was sat watching it and I was like, just because he's at the bottom of the stairs don't mean he can't twist his gun around and shoot you. Exactly. You absolute so-and-so. I was going to say, go <laughs> steady. Um, but yeah, and so yeah, Adam's a bit of a dick and even through mm. towards the end, like after he gets up to um, the office, up to Ham Van Satten's office, you know, he has the whole... Uh, uh, sort of mouth off with the doctor and then goes back to get the guns out and that fantastic line from the doctor saying like when Adam says oh I keep these in my office in case I need to fight my way out one day because they obviously they wipe your memory if you if you yeah. screw up you're out uh, and the doctor says what are you going to do throw your A levels at them <laughs> I love that line I'm pretty certain I've used that before I don't know when or how but I'm pretty certain I've said to somebody <laughs> what are you going to do throw your A levels at them uh, it's a, a, an amazing line and even the doctor can just sort of clock onto the fact that this guy's an asshole. I think I mean he's I'm pretty certain the doctor, especially the ninth doctor's got an asshole mm. Like he knows. I mean, the ninth doctor himself isn't exactly very far from Adam, because I mean it's like that line, is it near the beginning where um, I don't need to make claims, I know how good I am. Yeah, yeah. That and I'm like, yeah, he's got that level of genius, but for some reason with the Doctor, you don't feel like he's an ass about it because he has that level of We've humility seen his nice within side. himself. Yeah. yeah, like he's still got that kind of like side of I know that I'm not like the be all and end all to the world. Like, yes, I'm very clever, and yes, I'm clever at what I do, but realistically, I've had like horrible stuff in my life that I've had to deal with, and that brings him down a peg. Whereas Adam, I don't think has ever really had that. I mean, he was like eight years old and hacking into bloody US bases and stuff and then he gets scouted to go and work on alien artifacts it's like you've never been brought down a peg in your life have you no, no one has ever said no to you <laughs> yeah but actually you know what let's 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 talk about the doctor we're, we're 25 minutes in we've not even spoken about the, the <laughs> we've big, talked about the two big, characters we've talked about two assholes let's but let's talk about the doctor so Dalek is where the Doctor's past haunts him the most. It's where mm-hmm. the audience begin to learn about the Time War. If you didn't already know what it was, this is where it's a bit... It's not, like, completely clear, um, but you get more information as to what the Time War was, what happened, and who was there. Because when, obviously, the Doctor goes down to the Metaltron, which is what mm-hmm. Van Zandt calls his Dalek... Um, the Doctor freaks out. As far as he was aware, he was the last Time Lord. There were no Daleks left anywhere. And yet here one is. It's powerless. The Doctor laughs at him. Uh, and you oh, see this, this this seething rage, like this monologue with a Dalek. Like this. It's actually, it, you know what? It's such a testament to, to Nicholas Briggs with mm. his performances. Because Nicholas Briggs did Dalek voices in Big Finish. In fact, he's he's quite high up in Big Finish's ranks, actually. He, he does yeah. a lot of writing and producing of... Uh, of big finish stuff in Doctor Who so he still that's does how... the, the Dalek voices now doesn't he yeah he still does them now yeah. that's how I think that's why Russell Davies scouted him 
was mm-hmm. because he knew the big finish stuff and his Dalek voices were great. So he's like, well, you know, we'll get you in. Um, and it's like the, the, the seeing duologues happen between the Doctor and Daleks is so fantastic. Yeah, because um, you don't get it very often. You like, don't get it very often. And I if mean, you do, like normally you just get the Doctor chatting to the Supreme Dalek in, I don't know, Stolen Earth and Journey's End or Magician's Apprentice, which is familiar. Yeah. Like just chatting to the Supreme Dalek, it's not like this. Or it's and, some, or it's the Doctor sort of standing and showing off about, like, you know, it's Matt Smith in front of the Power Rangers, as we're going to call them. Um, yeah. You know, going, look at me, I'm so clever. I've got all this stuff. Like, what's your plan? It's it's never like a conversation. It's always like a coercion, yeah. um, which I think is... And also, I absolutely adore the bit where he says fantastic twice. You know, where he goes, oh, fantastic. fantastic. Oh, fantastic. And then, literally, that split second between the word fantastic ending and his face going from, like, extreme joy that the Dalek is broken to seething hatred is literally like I said a split second and the way Eccleston's face changes in that instant oh my god it honestly I'm literally like yeah. yes you, I, you I'm re- I was really good because I can basically quote this episode back to front like we watched this on my uh, original 2005 like uh, uh, pressing is like the, the wrong word but DVD. it makes sense but it's like it's my original Doctor Who series one volume two DVDs the blue uh, mm-hmm. blue box one huh? uh, which we, we watched it on my Xbox <laughs> my, my PlayStation's upstairs uh, in my room because I'm playing Last of Us Part 2 at the moment um, so we couldn't go to the Blu-ray so I just fished out the old DVD and by the time we got to the end of the episode uh, it was the, it the, started it was jittering started jittering the Xbox was going I can't read it I don't, I don't like it Trying obviously to I, read I'd media. watched Dalek on that DVD to death um, so yeah, like going back and watching it again. If you're, if you, this is the first time you've watched Doctor Who, or we watched Dalek, or you, this is the first time you've watched it in a long, long time. Go back and watch this scene again, and just watch Eccleston's face because Ames is completely right. Seeing the way he performs this whole scene is, is just, it's, it's, it's astonishing. It's so phenomenal. Like, As you I said, love his, like just his emotional, like, fantastic, journey. oh, fantastic. He's happy, and he says, "Powerless, the great space dustbin." Um, how do you feel? Um keep back Dalek says mm-hmm. back what for what are you going to do to me if you can't kill then what are you good for Dalek what's the point of you you're nothing what the hell are you here for like that that change from oh my god I can just actually talk to you and find out what on earth is going yeah. on why you're here and I can almost like he can almost torture him which he basically does he verbally mm-hmm. tortures this Dalek walking around him telling him about the fact that his entire race is dead terribly and ships on fire you're in the entire Dalek race wiped out in one second. I watched it happen. I made it happen. Why did the Dalek tell him to keep back? That's what I want to know. Because I think it's just. I think it was more to, just an. Because at the end of the day, an the Daleks are. Thing. Yeah, the Daleks are afraid of. Yeah. The Doctor. The Doctor. Like they, the the oncoming storm line is right at the end of this series, and you hear it constantly through oh, Doctor right. Who from here on out. I don't think the oncoming storm name was something that they called the Doctor in the classic series. I don't think they did. Like no. I said, I know Remembrance of the Daleks back to front, and that was the last Dalek episode. I mean, this if one. it hadn't been the Time War, then I doubt they would have a need to, would they? Well, exactly. But um, like the Daleks are afraid of the Doctor, and that's what it is. Like the Daleks know that he doesn't carry weapons, but they know mm. that they can, that he can defeat them without weapons. So the fact yeah. that there's a Doc, there's a Dalek that can't shoot its gun, can't use its plunger, it just has its words. It's broken. It's screwed. It's like, oh god, I'm 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 balls. I'm completely also, balls. I had a good thought because obviously he like so Rose is the one that reawakens the Dalek by touching him. Yeah. Um, if the Doctor had touched him. Do we think that the effect of the Dalek developing the emotions would have been the same? Because the Dalek says to him, you would make a good Dalek. Now, obviously, this is just coming through from, like, Eccleston's Doctor's hatred for, yeah. like, the the Daleks and how he had to kind of essentially commit genocide to stop them. Um, but, like, it's kind of poignant how, like, Rose goes in thinking it was, like, in tragedy and needing to be helped. But if the Doctor had touched it, do we think that the emotions and the DNA that it absorbed would have enacted the same mutation? I would think so. Because yeah, at the end I of the day, so. it absorbed DNA that had emotion. The, the mm-hmm. you know, Everything, as the Doctor explains to, to, to Henry Van Staten, he says, you know, the... Daleks had every emotion removed except hate and introducing alien DNA to that will make them think. We see that yeah. 
in Evolution of the Daleks in Series 3, which we'll get to. Mm-hmm. Like, I think he would have done the same thing. It might have even rejuvenated the Dalek a bit more, but it obviously it works better for the story to have a Rose. companion Dalek than a Doctor Dalek, almost. Yeah. Um, something that I'm not really sure I'd ever want to see is this kind of mm. like Time Lord Dalek hybrid, even though we had the whole Time the hybrid, hybrid thing then. throughout the course of Series... What was it? Nine. Oh, so we had the... Um the Time Lord Cybermen, didn't we? In the, yeah, we did, we did. The most recent, which is like, uh, no. Yeah, <laughs> it, was a, it was an that? interesting <laughs> one. But um, but yeah, back to that scene. Um, the, the Daleks saying, you destroyed us, and the Doctor having that moment of realisation that like he's been reminded of what he's, did, he's done. Yeah. He's if, not had like, any, he's not had any kind of hint. Like, I mean, he's had moments with Rose has gone, oh, where's your people? Can we go to your planet? Mm. I don't think Martha says that to him in series three. He says, can we go to yours? Can we yeah, go to I mean, anywhere? Rose has obviously asked the question, like, what happened? So the Doctor's throughout. had those moments where his past has sort of crept up on him, but this Dalek has gone outright, wait a minute, you killed everyone. Yeah, this is literally where you get sort of revealed what and happened this is, in the Yeah, and this is the first hint of it, like the Doctor saying, I made it happen regarding yeah. destroying the Dalek ships and even, but- like, killing it. I say somewhat killing his own people, but it's more that, like... And even then, like, the, the, the doc, when, when Henry Van Staten says, like, you know, the Dalek isn't the only alien on Earth, there's also you, and it's like, um, you know, you survived the time war, the Doctor said, not by choice. Yeah. So, it's that, um, it's that it, realisation in his face when the Dalek says, like, you you killed us or whatever, you destroyed us. Yeah. He's the, and he's like, I'm not happy about it, despite the fact that you were quite literally going to kill every last thing in the universe. It's like, I didn't do what I did because i'm that sort of person i did what i had to do because i had to do it and it's like that kind of thing on his face of seeing him be like this was not a decision that i made lightly and this is something that i carry with me forever because i mean he even feels guilty towards the end of the episode when rose is like look what he's doing it just wants the sunlight and rose is like he's not the one pointing the gun at me and all of a sudden you see the doctor sort of be like i I would never like i couldn't like realistically but in that moment he could have done like you know if it was to save rose he would have killed it you see this you say that but then you uh, we're kind of jumping a little bit forward we have that moment of can the doctor kill Mm. to save people and he he can't so whether he genuinely could like if he if rose genuinely stood back and said go on then do it like, yeah. I know how how much this means to you to, to end this war. Mm. Do it. Like, whether the Doctor really could. Like, we didn't I get that moment we'll of him know, squeezing the trigger. I know that we get it later on in the series, but we don't get it now. Yeah. Um, but, so, we, the Doctor has this the tiff with the Dalek, and he gets a bit angry, he gets a bit happy, but when the Dalek's out, and the Doctor realises, and the Doctor's explaining it to Henry Van Staten, like, what, near a city, Salt Lake City, one million all dead, he will just kill Mm-hmm. everything and i've always said this one of the reasons why i love dalek so much is it explores a bog standard dalek drone this dalek is nothing special yeah. it's just a normal dalek and just how dangerous they really are like in the old series you didn't get one dalek you got a bunch of them because yeah. they had to keep making it bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger because people wanted that like yeah. hence why when you go back and look at something like i don't know power of the daleks planet of the daleks whatever they always have those shots of like the miniatures that look very very wrong for their like mm. sort of shape but it's to imply that there are like thousands Loads of daleks of here they had to make it bigger and bigger and bigger you look at things like remembrance of the daleks that there's like yeah. two, a dalek civil war going on two factions of daleks the supreme and davros all going at it and now it's just like here's one yeah here's i think one it's dalek. really like you said it's really amazing to see the kind of power of one of them because you sort of towards i feel like the later on you get in like Doctor Who and New Who and like you said in sort of Classic Who where they kept making the Daleks bigger and bigger and bigger, it sort of, you sort of almost lose your kind of fear for them. Whereas yeah. this episode was really good at bringing back a classic enemy who kids or like people our age might not have known about um, and introducing it as a genuinely serious threat. Like the yeah. fact that he kills everyone in that room just by turning the sprinklers on and then electrocuting the floor it's like you know what's to sort of stop him waiting until it rains and then doing the same to the to nearest everyone. city yeah um and it's so it's it really establishes that kind of threat of like the power of 
one like you said one dalek and yeah i think they do it really really well especially this sort of just how many bullets they must fire at it and how empty their guns become and it's just like nothing's even touching this thing yeah um so yeah i think it's just it it really brings it home how scary they are because this is one of the first episodes where that sort of actually feels quite like terrifying the threat threat feels genuinely yeah like later on you sort of think that the further through you get especially into like matt smith's series and stuff you don't see the daleks as a threat ever like in this episode halfway through you think they've killed rose and that's like oh my god like how could you kill rose this early on and so obviously we know she like doesn't die but like that threat is genuinely there like he could have done but yeah, you're right. The Daleks did have... They've, they've not been great since... Mm. I, I, I always say that I think the Daleks were always the best in modern Who throughout the course of the Rusty Davies era once we hit Matt Smith. Because Victory of the Daleks was Matt's, was the was uh, Moffat's first like Dalek episode to do. And was that the Power we, Rangers? That's the Power Rangers. Like When we hit mm. that episode, it's like, wow, the Daleks have gone downhill. Yeah. And they just, they, they, there was, in fact, it got so bad that the Daleks were appearing so frequently, people were convinced that there was uh, something between the BBC and the, uh, the the estate of Terry Nation, the late Terry Nation who created the Daleks, who, whenever the Daleks appear in any of the episodes, his, his name is always in the credits. Mm. Uh, kind of in the same way that Ron Grainer always has his name in the, as the original composer for the the, uh, the the Doctor Who theme song. And usually most of the enemies have their own, um, their creators, creators uh, credited every time they're shown. Um, there was a thing saying that apparently the ter- the nation estate had said like the only way they can keep their, inverted commas, contract up. Because mm-hmm. back in the 60s, um, they wanted to make, or Terry Nation wanted to make uh, a series with the Daleks in universe but mm. apparently like with the way the licensing worked with the, the characters and the design and stuff that it kind of didn't really fully belong to the bbc i don't think that's the case now i could be mm. completely wrong but i know that he wanted to do more with them so it got so bad in doctor who with daleks that people thought the bbc had to put them into the series at least once to, even like, as like a cameo off. just to keep the rights to use them yeah which, it sounds so weird after 57 years but you know, it did feel like that because I mean, the more like they were in Matt Smith's era so often. Yeah, um, and none of the there haven't been many like great Dalek episodes since the end of Russell T Davies era. Like yeah, w- no. Witches Apprentice and Ma- Magician, Magician's Apprentice and Witches Familiar. I since going back to like I've appreciated those episodes a hell of a lot more. Which ones are they? Are they the one uh, Smith or Capaldi? Or? Uh, Capaldi. Where yeah, I thought he takes Davos's chair and stuff. Oh, that one, yeah, I like, enjoyed there's that. A, there's one. a lot more to that one I appreciate. Uh, yeah. And then, re- and I, I did this, and I did a Dalek ranking on the, the the Who Culture YouTube channel, and I put Resolution on the list, mm-hmm. and I said like you've got you've got to hear me out with Resolution because a lot of people did not like that. Like the Dalek looked weird. I loved the Resolution. Mm, I thought the, the yeah. Um, of course, people didn't like it. It's written by Chris Chibnall. It's got Jodie Whittaker in it. It's not real, not too. <laughs> like, I think I think Resolution was really good for the Daleks yeah, because do, it, it made them really scary good. again. Again, mentioning duologues with Nicholas Briggs and um, uh, whoa, what's her name? Is it like oh. is it like Charlotte Ritchie who played um, the who played about? Lynn? I don't yeah, know Charlotte who's... Ritchie. Like the the duologues between them. Were, were incredible between yeah. Nicholas Briggs and her and like that's sort of echoing how good Dalek was again it's a single Dalek and it's not very mm-hmm. often we've seen this even something like Into the Dalek which was Capaldi's second episode I don't even remember wasn't, that episode. wasn't that good and it, in, to some extent it featured one Dalek Rusty yeah. who I don't know why Rusty came back in Twice Upon a Time it's like no. boring like this was the peak of Dalek and, and even then like I said I think Dalek is the best Dalek episode of New Who yeah. but um those scenes of the Dalek actually just killing people, as you were saying, about like really presenting this threat as being something really tangible, those scenes were terrifying. Mm. And the fact that Seeing... he's literally just spinning backwards and forwards, I think they made a really good... Because I was sitting there watching it, and I think the fact that they made the Dalek 
spin backwards and forwards like so he stood in the middle of that hallway isn't he and there's soldiers at one end of the hallway and soldiers at the other like trying to box him in and he literally instead of just killing all the people off at one side and then the other he just spins and takes them out one by one like backwards and forwards and it's showing you that kind of like almost playful nature that the Dalek is like I'm just gonna kill you and then I'm gonna go around and kill you and then kill, kill you and he's sort of almost like toying with them to be like yeah you're next I wonder who's next and none of these bullets are even like touching anything and it's like they make a real big point of showing you the Dalek spinning backwards and forwards between these two groups of people just to show you how much fun he can have with it and he's not even worried about being taken down like at all like he's not no. worried about doing it quickly because he won't get through them all he's just there to enjoy killing everyone so much of the classic series had like companions and you know, the enemies of the Daleks, whoever, like, running up behind them and, like, grabbing them and pushing them around and things. And this, mm. the idea that the, the, the sort of uh, utility belt, almost, of the Dalek can spin around you, and you don't see it that often in Doctor no. Who now, as much as technically every time more Dalek can do it. Um, you don't see it that often, but it kind of showed that you can't sneak up behind a Dalek anymore like you could no. in the classic series. Like, you really can't. And then seeing the uh, the inverted and, like, the skeleton through the the body like as we've said we were we were nine years old yeah just about to turn 10 when this aired uh that was terrifying mm. and that really stuck with me as a kid and that's something they took from from remembrance of the daleks the first time you see a dalek kill somebody in remembrance of the daleks part one you see that skeleton through the body yeah. it's the first time they did that effect and it was for back then in 1988, that must have been terrifying. Because mm -hmm. normally you just had the either the entire screen turned inverted, like it did in Genesis of the Daleks, or you had like a rough, like, um, like a sort of a, a, an inverted section around the person right. that got like shot, like haze. you had. Yeah, like in in the six, in the fifth and sixth Doctor era, and then obviously the seventh, they just went, okay, we're going to go all out. It only happens once, yeah. one shot, and it's very blatantly like painted on almost. Uh, but it works. It's terrifying. And they, they bring that back. And they they really play with the continuity because so many people were like, oh my God, you see the Dalek in a flight of stairs. Adam, as we said, makes the comment about it. Oh my God, the Dalek's screwed. Oh my God, it's flown for the first time. No, it hasn't. No. Daleks have flown before. They flew in the end of part one of Remembrance of the Daleks. You see a Dalek fly up the stairs. First time it happens in the uh, ever. But... That's the first time it happened, not in Dalek. But, but um, I mean, you know, how were Adam? How was Adam to know that? <laughs> well, exactly. He was just going to be making a quippy dick comment about it. But <laughs> Dalek killing everyone in the um, the the weapons testing area by shooting the uh, fire thing, getting the splinters to turn on, and then just electrocuting everyone. That was terrifying. The shots mm. of the people lying dead, yeah, like even afterwards. the bloke, in, even the bloke, in, the, sort of the bigger bloke in the lab coat. That shot always got to me. The idea mm. that you could be there and not be in any kind of position to end up having to shoot anything but as the but doctor says give to guns anyway. to the doctors the lawyers the anyone everyone uh, and seeing him dead and it really haunted me that but then mm. following that scene comes probably Eccleston's defining doctor moment yeah the discussion with the Dalek after he's murdered everyone the first time he's just talking to this Dalek after he's seen him in the cage now he's been he's downloaded the internet he knows everything he's rejuvenated he's all shiny he just killed a bunch of people and now the doctor's going to talk to him. Yeah. And the Dalek's questioning itself. We know, we obviously we don't know yet the Dalek's mutating thanks to Rose, but he's questioning what he should do because the Daleks don't exist. They're gone. Mm -hmm. you, I scanned your satellites and radio telescopes, nothing. And the doctor has the, uh, he tells the Dalek to kill himself. Yeah. And he just goes off on one. Understandably, goes I completely off on one. I said to you, didn't I, when we were watching it, I love that scene because you can tell that they've shot all of Eccleston's bits as the same piece of film, as it mm. were, because he like, he's so ferociously going at this dialogue that he actually like, spits as he's saying it. And later on, like and in that same sort of clip back and forth between the Dalek and the Doctor, you can see that bit of spit stays on his lip, which... Yeah like i think it's really good because obviously a lot of the time you just get like cutaways and like different shots but the fact that they kept that means that they, he obviously did such a good job during that like whole thing and he does he does a phenomenal job of saying like why don't you know why don't you kill yourself sort of thing why don't you just die that yeah. it's like you know i wonder you how many times feel it, i wonder that how frustration. many 
I wonder how many takes it took for them to do that because it's obvious that Eccleston knew what was going on. Obviously, with Rusty Davies being about the show, he wouldn't have just um, like brought up this whole time war thing and not had something to yeah. back it up. Cough, cough, chip, little timeless child. I hope you've got explanations for that. <laughs> um, obviously, Eccleston knows what happened. He's told by Russell. Yeah, the the arc of the Doctor, and he knows, and you can see him portraying that. It's like you, like I said, you go back and you watch this series, knowing where, knowing what happened, really like clear as day. Uh, mm. When we get to twenty thirteen, you can really tell that he's going for it, and I, I'd oh, love, I'd absolutely. love to know that as as Eccleston as a character actor, um, like he's able to just do it. Like, yeah. he knows what the Doctor's feeling. He can portray that rage. We know that enough already. And just see him go ham on this Dalek. And, you know, as you said, spitting, you know, rid the universe of your filth. Why don't you just die? Like, it's you, something... you see you see the Doctor angry at Daleks again. Victory of the Daleks. The Doctor goes absolutely, absolutely ham on the Dalek with a with a bit of metal, doesn't he? Yeah. And it's like that... It's that like the just, Churchill that, episode. Yeah, that's Victory of the Daleks. You just yeah. see this sort of, like, just blind rage... Whereas mm. this isn't blind rage. This is pure, unfiltered hatred. hatred and there's not many yeah. doctors that have managed to show that in the past. You know, you no. kind of get the sort of campy approach to the the, the doctor back in the day, like the, the less gritty nature of it. Mm. Like I, I mentioned Planet of the Daleks and right at the end of the first part of that, when they spray paint the invisible Dalek because yeah. the spirit on people are invisible and the Daleks are there to mm-hmm. harness invisibility even just the way he says Daleks just sounds kind of like odd yeah. whereas when you see the Doctor's reaction to seeing the Dalek in the cell for the first time he's like screaming let me out like he's terrified and obviously yeah. the, the tables turn and so on but that scene with the, the duologue the second duologue between the Doctor and the Dalek is just sublime i mean this is this is literally one of the reasons why i I say to people don't skip nine you have to watch nine because you see so much of his character oh this episode is so poignant like i mean what i it's one of these things that you don't get to see i might have already said this i'm not sure but like the doctor doesn't really talk to the like you never get this opportunity to have the doctor and a dalek have an open and honest conversation i mean he even says to van Staten, he's like you know do you know what a doctor do, do you know what a doctor is do you know what a dalek is van Staten? it's honest and that makes it better than you because at least yeah. it will tell you what it's there for and you know this dalek is literally stood there going where do i get my orders i need to kill that is my primary instinct is to kill and the doctor's like yeah but why what's why like there what is, is no the point, point? It's and like, it's this like, is just how he's programmed so he's gonna go with that the primary order it's almost like the Doctor's trying to get to kind of because this is the only Dalek really that has ever been this kind of in well I say in close proximity like mental mentally and kind of emotionally in close proximity to the Doctor like otherwise I feel like they're all kind of like separated by this wall of just like I need to hate you because I need to hate you whereas this is very trying to get to the nitty gritty of why the Doctor and the Daleks hate each other so much, which I think it does so well to set you up for like everything else that comes afterwards, because you now understand based on how he's reacted to the Dalek in this episode, why that hatred is so furious throughout. But like, I feel like the Doctor kind of loses a lot of that towards like, maybe not so much Tennant, but Matt Smith and onwards, definitely like they just became the Doctor's enemy. They weren't like, the doctor's enemy because of anything sort of more heavy like eccleston carries that very like you said carries it very well in terms of um i i hate the daleks because they were literally like they caused me to kill my own people like this is why i hate them because of the time war and all this stuff but later on with smith and capaldi i feel like they're just sort of like we we hate them because they're our enemy and it's like but like you've lost that like really deep emotional connection to why they are your enemy in the first place and this is something that episode does so well i think that's why the daleks got so bad Mm. and overused over the course of new who like i mentioned this in the in the my dalek ranking episode that uh my dalek ranking list sorry that usually a doctor got a dalek story and that was it yeah like in the 60s 
Um, Hartnell and Patrick Troughton both got like crap loads of Dalek episodes, but it's mainly because Dalek Mania was such a huge thing yeah. in the 1960s. The BBC were making a killing on merchandising, and the ratings were through the roof, especially when the Daleks were present. Yeah. Um, but after that, each Doctor, like I think, I'm pretty certain. Um, uh, John Pertwee had two Dalek stories in uh, Planet of the Daleks and Day of the Daleks. I believe he only had two. Cause Tom Baker had two, which were Genesis and Destiny of the Daleks. Right. Peter Davison had one, which was Resurrection of the Daleks, which is bringing back Davros. Yeah. Um, which was kind of the first time I, I put this in my ranking and I said that it was the first time you really see the the pure hatred mm-hmm. the Dalek has for the Doctor. The, sorry, the Doctor has for the Daleks. Even in Genesis, when the Doctor couldn't quite commit genocide against just about to be produced Daleks. Yeah. Whereas in Resurrection, he was like, I'm going to kill Davros. I'm literally mm. going to shoot you in the face, which that he almost does. That is tough look. <laughs> Sixth Doctor had res- uh, Revelation of the Daleks, which was which was All okay. Which was okay. And then obviously, mm-hmm. uh, Sylvester McCoy had res- uh, Remembrance, which is my which was Stan Bates being my favorite Dalek story. And then Dalek we had, Re- res- what was it, Resolution? And Resolution, and now we've got, of- we've got Revolution of the Daleks Revel- coming yeah, up Yeah, I mean, seriously, all the arts, why? Yeah, I know. <laughs> but um, this is like, the Doctor's relationship with this Dalek is... is it's so fiery and like mm. you said it does it does kind of get lost as the series continues but this dalek is actually a character like normally we yeah. see the daleks as just a, a plot a, a, yeah a, a drone which is what mm-hmm. they are at the end of the day like they, they, they try to do it again with rusty in yeah. capaldi's series in series nine no series eight of capaldi uh, and then series 10 again when he appears in twice upon a time mm. but no one cared about the dalek no, I just, no, no one cared. It's like I don't they, even they, remember they kind of, him. They tried to do it again, and it's like it's it's hard. Like if if they had done like almost no Dalek stories between this and Into the Dalek, then maybe it, it would have been yeah. better. Maybe it would have worked. Maybe the Daleks need to be dropped more. Mm. They need to stop coming back. Like I said, they're, they're, there's only been a handful of good episodes in recent years. I mean, so, some of the Tenant episodes were like pretty decent with the Daleks but I think that's because Tennant like I said Tennant kind of carries that weightiness to him in the same way that Eccleston does quite well and I think because um, Russell like introduced the whole time war thing he knows yeah. it the best as much as it was Moffat in the end who sort of tied it up yeah. with Day of the Doctor he's the one who introduced it so he can, he can really play up to that emotional connection the Doctor has with the Daleks I mean like we'll get to series three eventually, but you know, Evo- Daleks take Manhattan, the evolution of the Daleks. Like some people yeah. cite that as not being great. I didn't mind it. Mm, I thought it was an interesting right. avenue, but you know. Whatever. I mean, I sort of understand the kind of exploration of Daleks merging with humans to become more sort of like powerful, but I think I um, yeah, I don't know. Like I said, we'll discuss that when we get to the episode because there's yeah. a lot of things I sort of think don't work quite well and do work okay, but yeah, yeah, um, but yeah. This Dalek becomes more of a character, like, after absorbing Rose's DNA, beginning to feel, which kind of interestingly does kind of mirror Evolution of the Daleks in Series 3. Yeah. But seeing it question itself, like, I think there's a part... I remember as a kid thinking, oh, it's just going a bit insane. He says, I'm I'm contaminated, I'm mutating. It's just sort of losing it. Yeah. Whereas now you look at it and it's it's because it's gaining Mm -hmm. emotion. It's, it's, It's starting to think differently and... For the reintroduction of the Daleks, it's such a a, a departure from probably what people were expecting when they yeah. were expecting the Daleks to come back in 2005. Like, they were expecting another big bombastic Dalek episode. Like I said, Remembrance of the Daleks was the last one. And in that, they literally wrote in a Dalek with a big-ass gun yeah. that was there just to blow stuff <laughs> Special up. Special weapon style. Which was it. great. And I think that's what people were maybe expecting it to be. Mm, so, I'm glad it wasn't though, because like I feel like this episode was what was needed to mm. reintroduce the Daleks to new viewers and like you know a younger audience, well a new a new audience, um, because I mean you know it's it's very well explored rather than just going in there all guns blazing, even though the Dalek is all guns blazing. It also shows it being clever. And being able to like outsmart you, like the fact that it's a billion combinations. Well, that you know, Dalek can com- calculate a hundred billion combinations in one second, and then it absorbs the internet, and then it shoots the fire, like the sprinklers, and it's like showing you how clever it is. And the fact that it can fly up the stairs, it's like you can't outsmart this Dalek. Like it will literally 
sort of reign supreme over everything nobody is smart enough to stop it really no. um but yeah like you said it becomes more of a character like if you sort of said to me what daleks do you remember from new who i would say unfortunately the power ranger daleks because they were so rubbish um <laughs> yeah and yes i do refer to them as power ranger daleks every time we talk about them um yeah. and this one like i don't really the only other one that I would probably say that I remember off the top of my head is Asylum of the Daleks, but that's... Is that is that the episode? Is that what it's called? Asylum of the Daleks, yeah. Yeah, that is the episode, with Matt Smith and that going down to the Dalek planet. Yeah. Yeah, that's the only other one I remember, but again, it's because it could have been so much better. So, yeah. like, in terms of good Dalek episodes, this would be the one that I would say, oh, what about the one in the first series? Like... Yeah. And again, don't skip nine. There's some nine. real gold in this. And seeing, you know, the Doctor at the end, the Dalek mutates enough to, to spare Van Staten's life and wants to see the sunlight. You see the, you see the Dalek properly for the mm-hmm. first time ever in the series. We see glimpses of green blobby stuff in the casings after they've been destroyed in the classic series. In, even in the first Dalek series, you see a claw come out from under the, uh, the cloak when they pull the Dalek out of its casing in, in the original dalek story yeah um, but this is the first time we see it as a whole and then they couldn't stop showing us the daleks in the new series no. but like i said seeing this it's almost this this frail creature it really changes how you see the dalek and that was the final nail mm-hmm. in this dalek is something different it's something new yeah. as much i mean even down to the visual design because these are daleks that look different they look so much more they're bigger they are chunkier than the original daleks i quite uh, like and they're meant i to love look, the time war daleks i think I they're do, beautiful yeah. they 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 really wanted them to look like tanks mm-hmm. and they really do that as I much think... as the the people thought oh they're really blingy because they're all bronze and gold yeah but they work so well as this gritty time mm-hmm. war dalek and and it really does sh- show you that this is a new era yeah so seeing like old and new daleks together even in like as much as i love that and a nostalgia factor it does seem kind of strange mm. but I um mean, what you were saying about um seeing like almost i feel like in the beginning when rose is talking to it like oh it's being tortured and stuff before you realize that it's a dalek right at the beginning of the episode i mean some people might have realized it's a dalek when you see the eye stalk vision and whatnot um, and you'd realize it's a dalek when the episode's called dalek yes i know but <laughs> bear with me here um when the what's his name the guy torturing him uh simmons simmons when he's torturing him, you do, like, the fact that it's screaming, you do sort of almost have that inkling of, like, oh, my God, I actually kind of feel sorry for it. And the fact that Rose goes in and, the, like, I know that the Dalek's probably just mainly manipulating her by saying, I've never met a human that's not afraid of me sort of thing. Um, but the way Rose kind of is like, oh, I'm really sorry, like, we ha- we can help. It And then, to, like, it's sort of reflected at the end when she genuinely means it. Like, it's like, I can help you. Like, I want to help you. Um, and that's why she eventually orders it to die. But it does kind of humanise the Daleks to like give it this kind of, whether it be false emotion or real emotion before she touches it or whatever. Um, you do almost feel kind of sorry for it, but then you have to catch yourself and be like, hang on, I feel sorry for a Dalek. Why do I feel sorry for a Dalek? Yeah. Um, but I think it is because you see it, like, you know, open its shell and you see what it wants and it literally just wants the sunlight and then it's ready to die and it's like, what, eh? Huh? Eh? Why do yeah. I feel sorry for this Dalek that, it, you know, killed everyone? Yeah, and, and seeing the Doctor at the end as well wielding a weapon and just mm. wanting to blow blow the thing to smithereens. Like, it's so different. It, it really shows this change in the Doctor's psyche and it kind of, it reintroduces why the Doctor's sort of emotions and characterization changes so much when he's up against the Daleks. I think that's probably why newer Doctors don't seem to work as well with Daleks because they they stay the same. Like, yeah. when this episode aired, there was this very, like, apparent notice from the viewers and critics to say that this Doctor is so different. And it's like, well, he will mm. be. This is the first glimpse of the Time War he's had in, in God knows how long it's been since the time war for the doctor so of course he's going to change of course he's going to get angry he's having borderline ptsd right now so it's yeah, going to be different and i think affect him and i think that's why the doctor in newer series doesn't feel that different or doesn't mm. feel right because the doctor hasn't changed the doctor should become this fiery ball of pure hatred whenever they're about i kind of because... like how 
Oh, almost, yeah, coming back. I, I kind of like how they almost like swap places in they this do. episode. Like yeah. he becomes the like Rose says, he's not the one pointing the gun at me, and the Doctor then has to check himself, and it's like, oh, I got so caught up in trying to save you that I lost what this whole thing is about and who yeah. I am trying to be. Um, and you know. It's sort of, it's so like, you know, the Doctor is the ends as the one with the gun and the Dalek ends as the one vulnerable and opening himself up to just the fact that it just wants to be free or feel free for like yeah. once in its life. Um, like it has, it has that, that sort of relief from it. Yeah. And obviously Rose orders it to kill itself and the mm-hmm. Doctor wins the war. So it's quite... You know, as the, as the Dalek he? says, you know, you would make a good Dalek, and mm. it's because he is—he's almost thinking like one. He just wants it to die, which is exactly how Daleks think. So, yeah. this episode is—it's—it's—it's it's, it's perfect. It's beautiful. Mm-hmm. It, even just the, the music is so unique to oh, it. Oh, the music—the way, the way that it's shot. There's so many. If you watch that back, there's so many close-ups of just faces because yeah. that's what they want to play up on. They want to play up on how scared people are the shot of um dimaggio on the stairs shooting at this dalek she knows she's not going to make it out Mm -hmm. and you see it in her face as she's blinking when she's shooting if she's this trained soldier they wouldn't be no they wouldn't be blinking but they wouldn't look so frightened when up against an enemy but she knows how dangerous this thing is and she's Mm -hmm. she knows she's gonna die it's yeah it's it's terrifying and that's why it scared me so much as a kid Mm. i mean like you said the music like there was one point i can't remember what point it was but i was watching it thinking god the music is so perfect in this scene like i think it's in the original when the doctor goes down into the cage for the first time um i think it's that bit when the doctor's talking to the dalek in that first duologue and it's like you know the music in the background was just so well done and i was literally sat there thinking like because who is it that writes the music in this murray gold murray gold i literally sat there and i was like oh murray gold you genius like it it almost plays up to like exactly how like every every moment of the music is paired to the dialogue so well like the the point when the doctor says i'm not the same i'm not and then he pauses and then the music comes back up with like even like a kind of lighter note which then slowly sort of bends into a into, into a, a minor note contorted, and the doctor says like, maybe we are and then he, he it evolves into the doctor wanting to trying to kill the dalek there and then mm-hmm. so it plays out almost like a spoken word musical yeah like the music is so perfectly intrins- intrinsical to the actual story it's you do have the the standard oh let's get some music bump pumping while they're running yeah but and I let's mean, get that's... the sense of like you know the, the dread of the, the bulkhead door closing and so on and so forth they, they play up on it so well and you can tell they really put the time in because at the end of the day they would do yeah it's the return of the daleks after what would it be How 17 years, years yeah. or something like it, they, they will of course have put all the effort possible into mm-hmm. making this return perfect and i really think they did and yeah, it's a shame definitely to think that in the future you know a couple of years after this episode aired that they started going a bit peaked on. five years after it aired the daleks went really dumb mm. but that's something we'll get to when we hit series five Woo-hoo. but um otherwise that's about all the time we have to talk about dalek as much as we could probably I feel like I could it. talk about this forever. I could just, <laughs> I would just do a podcast of me doing the entire script by myself. Mm, I'll no, do all the voices. No It'd be great. You'll that. love it, and no you will listen that. to it. No one wants that. That's just rude. <laughs> but, uh, but thank you for listening. I hope you've uh, enjoyed it. If you've got any questions regarding the uh, the series to go forward, we've got a long game next week. Going to platform, uh, no, not platform, satellite five. Lots satellite of space five. platforms. Satellite five with a uh, Simon Pegg in Doctor mm-hmm. Who. 10 out of 10. Which I turned uh, around to you and I went, I always think that's Simon Pegg. And you were like, it is Simon Pegg. It is Pegg. Simon Pegg. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Because he did, he does all the narration for Doctor Who Confidential in series one. Yeah. Well. Uh, but yeah, so we're going to go and do it. I mean, he's taking Adam with us as well. Yay. Yay. We're going to see if you didn't like Adam now, you're not going to like him next week Great. either. Let's just put it that way. But otherwise, thank you very much for listening to us pick apart an episode about a Dalek and okay. why we love it so damn much. <laughs> oh God, I want to go watch it again. No. I don't know. No, I've got, I'm going to play more Last of Us, I think. <laughs> but if you've got any questions regarding Doctor Who as a whole or regarding the episodes upcoming, if you've got any questions about the long game next week, then please do send them to us on Twitter at WhoCulture using the hashtag Escaping Kasturbaris. If you tweet us at them during the week, we watch the episode and record our podcast on a Sunday, post it on a Monday. So if you want to get us questions by then, please, please 
do. Yes, please. Otherwise, you can find me on Twitter at Pickup Change Toe. I've been Rich. I should really say that as well. <laughs> and I've been Amy, and you can find me at Ames underscore Elizabeth. Thank you very, very much for listening. Have a fantastic week. Take care of yourselves. Goodbye. We'll see you then. Bye. Bye.